Well, welcome. Glad you could be here. I'm glad I could be here. We were driving down yesterday and uh, the 11th plague of Egypt was upon us. It was one of those, it was a windstorm. If we, my Benita's car usually gets about 30 miles a gallon and we were getting about 22, 23. So I got down here almost to town and it said, it said almost out of fuel. And they're going, well, that can't be. I mean, usually I get on a full tank of gas, I'll, I'll get, you know, 400, 500 miles. And I'm going, I've only gone 200 and something miles and I'm already on empty. So it was, uh, it was eating it up. So anyway, it was, uh, we're good to get here and had a good night's rest and I uh, hope that everybody else did too. Uh, thank uh, Jason for the singing and for the leading that song and John for his prayers. I want to do a lesson, if you don't mind, in uh, the book of Acts. We're going to look at the story of the Apostle Paul. I have, uh, over the last uh, two or three years, I have been reading lots and lots of books on the Apostle Paul's life. And I've developed a, new, a, a, a series on the, the life of the Apostle Paul. And, uh, and I just, you, I, you know, if you look at Bible heroes, who would you pick? You know, God designed us to look at the life of Saul of Tarsus. He, he, and the reason I can say that is, out of all the Bible characters that there are, who has more bio, who has a greater biography than anybody else? It's Paul. You would think, well, Moses maybe, but Moses did a lot of writing, but we don't have a lot of story of the, the we do have his birth a little bit. We got a few details, but we don't have a lot about really Moses. You have a lot about David to some degree, but you don't have the, and, and, and Peter and John in the New Testament, but it's Paul that God designed. If you look at his life from, he gives us more biography than anybody else by a long shot, really. All of his upbringing, his education, where he was born, who his, who his parents were, uh, things like where he grew up, uh, where he was educated. All those details are found in the life of Paul. He tells us again and again about his life story. It's kind of interesting that Paul says, you know, forgetting those things which are behind and leading the things which are ahead. He, but he doesn't forget what's behind. I mean, he goes back again and again and again. He tells us his, his life story. And there's a reason for that. You know what that reason is? God said, follow this man. We're going to see again and again passages that talk about follow me, imitate me, do what I do. The things you heard and learned and received in me, do, and the God of peace will be with you. Over and over and over again, we find Saul and, or Paul telling us this. I call this lesson just a killer comes to Christ. I want to talk about his conversion story. And the reason I want to talk about it is not just for the interest of it, it's for the example of it. Whether you need to obey the gospel or whether you need to teach somebody else to obey the gospel. I run across people a lot when, in my Bible studies. I've got about 10 or 12 going right now. And we got with two or three with the non-Christians. And one of the things I try to make sure they understand is no matter how desperate your life is, how bad your life is, there's always the grace of God. Tomorrow morning at 8 o'clock, I'm giving a speech in Stillwater State Prison in a, to a bunch of graduates. I'm in a little thing called Prison Fellowship, and they've invited me to come do kind of the, the graduation speech. And, uh, and so working with prisoners, uh, a lot of these guys you talked with, they think, and, and by the way, Stillwater is maximum five security. It is the guys who have murdered people. I've had a Bible study with one of the guys there, and uh, he'd kill two people. And, uh, and, and others like that that I've studied with over the years, and they just kind of say, well, God could never save a wretch like me. And I said, you know, that quote is found in the Bible, <laughs> that, the, that God can save a wretch like you. And in fact, the Apostle Paul would say, God set me up as an example that you might see in me the grace of God because Paul called himself the what of sinners? The chief of sinners. And he says, if he would save a wretch like me, he would save you. And so we can't get any worse than looking at the life of the Apostle Paul. In 1 Timothy chapter 1, we'll just look at a few verses together before we get into the actual story in Acts and his conversion. In 1 Timothy chapter 1, I want you to look at verses 15 and 16 with me. 1 Timothy chapter 1, verses 15 and 16. It says, This is a faithful saying and worthy of all acceptance, 
that Christ Jesus came into the world to do what? To save sinners. Jesus came to save sinners, of whom I am the chief, or the foremost of all, one translation puts it. However, for this reason, for this reason, I obtained mercy that in me first, now he wasn't the first conversion, but in me first, he says, I'm exhibit A in God's description of who he would save. In me first, Jesus Christ might show all long suffering, and he uses a word that I want to in, in, in encourage you to think about. As a pattern, my, my, my translation in the New King James, this is what the Apostle Paul used, uh, a pattern to those who are going to believe on him for everlasting life. Paul says, I am a pattern, I am the role model, I am the example of what God can and will and has done for sinners. And it's for everlasting life, for eternal life. Paul, of course, would later say at the end of his life when he writes Timothy, I have fought a good fight, I have finished the race, I have kept the faith, henceforth there is laid up for me a crown of righteousness. Not to me only, but unto all those who love his appearing. And so Paul is going to tell us very, very distinctly that I am the example that God has set up. And he says, look at me, follow me. Follow me to the baptismal waters and follow me into life in Christ Jesus. In Philippians chapter 3, I'm going to use a couple of times. In, in, to, the, to the Philippians, he made the statement in Philippians chapter 3 and in verse 7. And then we'll flip over to chapter 4 and verse 9. Philippians chapter 3 verse 7. He says, join in following my example. Join in following my example. And he'll later go into that passage and say, you have us for a pattern. At least my, the New King James puts it that way. You have us for an example. You have us for a pattern. In other words, do what I do and you'll get what I got. And what he got was the grace of God and the mercy of God and the salvation of Jesus Christ. Look over in Philippians 4 and verse 9. I quoted it a moment ago. I want, I want you to see it in your own Bible. Philippians 4 and in verse 9. After saying in verse 8, you know, would it things, th think on things that are true and honorable and just and pure and lovely and a good report and virtuous and praiseworthy. Think on these things. And then he says, the things that you have learned and received and heard and seen in me do, and the God of peace will be with you. Now, if that's not just simply saying, look at me, now, that seems kind of arrogant, doesn't it? That's kind of egotistical. Look at me. Follow me. You know? I mean, my grandkids always, you know, when they want to twirl around and do things, they and do somersaults, and they say, look at me, Papa, look at me. Well, that's one thing. But here when Paul's saying, look at me, he's saying, look what God has done even in me. The wretch that I was, i am now gone from sinner to saint. You do what I do, you'll get what I got. And we know what Paul got. We got he got salvation. To the Corinthians, here's one I want to emphasize in both of our lessons today. In 1 Corinthians chapter 4 and verse 6, 16, and then in as 1 Corinthians chapter 4 and verse 16. He just simply made a statement where he says, I urge you, imitate me. I urge you, I plead with you, imitate me. Do what I did. And then the one I like to use often in 1 Corinthians 11, verse 1. This is kind of the, in fact, the title to my series on the Apostle Paul. 1 Corinthians 11 and in verse 1. We're going to come back to this verse several times, but I want you to see it. In 1 Corinthians 11 and in verse 1. Imitate me. That sounds pretty good, doesn't it? But what does he then say? Just as... I imitate Christ. Now, could Peter tell us, imitate me? Yes. But, and he would say, but as I imitate Christ. But can we find times when Peter didn't do such a good thing? We call it apostolic example, that you're supposed to follow the apostles, but only in the sense that you see God approving of what they did. Like we call it approved apostolic example. When an apostle does something like we find in Acts 20, verse 7, that Paul stayed in the, in the church there, and, and, and on the first day of the week, they, they, they broke bread, they, they took the Lord's Supper. We have an apostolic example of taking the Lord's Supper and God approving of it. But we also have an apostolic examples of Peter playing the hypocrite 
eating with the Gentiles. Then when the Jews show up, he doesn't eat with the Gentiles. And Paul says, I have to rebuke him to his face. And so there's an example where he says, don't imitate me because I'm not imitating Christ. And so in Paul's case, what I want to, what I'm emphasizing here is I want you to be able to see that Paul is encouraging us. Look through my life. I'm giving you plenty of biography of myself. And I want you to see in my conversion story of mine and of my trying to teach others to become Christians, here's what God says we should do. You remember when Jesus made the statement in, in Matthew 16, 24, he says to his disciples, if anyone desires to come after me, let him deny himself, take up his cross and what? Follow me. Take up the cross and follow me. Jesus, of course, is going to take up his cross in the literal sense. And he's telling us to whatever, whatever it costs, whatever it costs you, follow me. And I'm telling you, whatever you're going to get from me is going to be infinitely greater than anything you got from, the, from your enemies. Follow me. But now Paul turns around and says basically the same thing. Imitate me. I'm a pattern. I'm an example. Do what I did and you'll get what I got. And that's what I want us to make sure we understand. Now, I want to ask you the question. Here's, here's what this whole series did to me. I read that statement, imitate me as I imitate Christ, and I thought, can, can I tell you guys that? Jason, imitate me. Look at me, Jason. Imitate me as I imitate Christ. Can you say that? Can we all say that? We should. I mean, what other point does, was Jesus making when he said in, in, in the Sermon on the Mount, let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father in heaven. Isn't that really the same thing? that I'm, He's saying, look, tell the world, look at me. My light is shining. This little Christian light of mine, I'm going to let it shine. I want you to be able to see me and follow me because I'm imitating and following Jesus Christ. That's a challenge. Most of us would be kind of, oh, I don't want to tell everybody, to lie. You know, I'm your example, follow me. But let me tell you something, God says for you to be that. What Paul is saying is exactly what you should be saying and what I should be saying. And that's scary, yes, because we're setting ourselves up to say, well, I sure don't want to play the hypocrite. I don't want anybody to look at me and say, oh, if that's what a Christian is, what's the, why should I follow that? But if you're letting your light shine, and the word light means you're walking in the light as he is in the light. 1 John 1 verse 7, isn't that the same thing? If we're walking in the light as he is in the light, we're letting our light shine and saying, that's how God gets glory, by you looking at me. We want you to look at me so we can know how do we ought to live our lives. But now to do that, I, if Saul is really saying that, I want to go back into Saul's life and I want to see the old man, I call it Paul B.C., before Christ. Paul, before he became a Christian, I want to look at his life and we're going to say, and the reason I do that, if, whether I'm preaching, with, working with prisoners or whether I'm working with just anybody who, who looks at themselves and says, well, God would never save me. I, I'm, too, I'm just too much of a sinner. And, and, and Paul's saying, no, no, no. Look and see what I have done. In, in Romans 6, I, I, I never baptize anybody without reading Romans 6. It, it's just the most powerful passage in the Bible to describe what baptism is. It's a baptism that leads us to be raised to walk in what? Newness of life. But then he goes back and explains what that newness of life is and what the oldness of life was. That you were a slave to, right, uh, to ungodliness and unrighteousness and now you become a servant or a slave to righteousness. Your life has done a 180 is what it's doing. And that's what Romans 6 is arguing. Baptism is that, is that crossroads you've come to and said, this way or this way, I'm going to go continue to walk the broad way that leads to destruction, or I'm going to now decide I'm going to go on this little bitty narrow road that leads to eternal life. I've made that decision, and baptism is that crucifixion to where I've been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but Christ lives in me. Galatians 2 and verse 20. Baptism is that, is that turning point in your life. 
to where I, there was an old man. And so in Romans 6, verse 6 and 7, after talking about baptism, he says, knowing this, that our old man was crucified with him, that the body of sin might be done away with. Is that saying you'll never sin again? Of course not. We, in fact, what does John say? If a man says, I have no sin, he deceives himself and the truth is not in him. You, we, we can't walk around saying, I have never, I've, since I've been baptized, I've never sinned. I met a lady one time at a, at a Bible study. I don't know, Benita, were you in that room with me? And this lady said, I haven't committed a sin in 20 years. And I said, you just did. The Bible would clearly say you just did. And so, look, I was crucified with Christ. My sins were done away with that we should no longer, and here's the point, be slaves of sin. Before you became a Christian, like Paul, he was a slave to sin. And now, I don't live that life anymore. That doesn't mean, it just means habitually I don't live in sin anymore. I do stumble from time to time, but I seek God's forgiveness and He forgives me and cleanses me from all unrighteousness. But that's why he says in verse 7, at baptism, for he who has died, that means crucified, been baptized, has been freed from sin. That's the old Paul. Look over in Philippians chapter 3, verse 13. <coughs> this is one of, my great, one of the great verses I was mentioning a few moments ago. Philippians 3 and verse 13. Brethren, I do not count myself to have apprehended. That means I've got heaven already secured. I, I'm, I haven't arrived. And if Paul could say at the end of his, near the end of his life, after 30 years of ministry, if he could say, I have not yet secured my salvation. I have not, been, I have not apprehended my crown of life yet. But here's one thing I do, he goes on to say. But one thing I do, forgetting those things which are behind. So here's Paul's old man, and we're going to talk about that here for the next few minutes. Paul's old man Forget those things which are behind, which, of course, he never did, actually. And reaching forward to those things which lie ahead, I press toward the goal of the, or the mark of the prize of the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. But Paul's going to spend the rest of his life talking about his past. Now, he's saying, I'm forgetting in the sense that God forgave me, and I, I, I am forgiven, and I have the grace of God, and His grace is great and amazing, and His mercy is rich. And he's going to talk about that over and over again. But he says, here's one thing you can't do. Don't live with your past because it, paralysis by analysis. Isn't that what happens? If you just, you just you, you freeze up and you go, oh, I was so bad. God could never. And you start thinking and talk like that. And Satan uses that against you. He wants you to become paralyzed so you do not move forward and, and move toward that mark of the prize of the high calling. Let's look at some things, and we're not going to have time to look up all these verses, so I'll quote a few of them. But in Acts chapter 9, we want to go back to Paul's old man. Go back to Paul's old life. Now, we know what Acts chapter 9 is, don't we? It's going to be the story of his conversion. And so in Acts chapter 7, remember, what was he doing with Stephen? Remember, he was holding the, the clothes of the, the men who were stoning Stephen. Um, and so and in Acts chapter 8, he was wreaking havoc against the church. Now in Acts chapter 9, he comes and he says, Then Saul, <laughs> it's hard for me to even read this, still breathing threats and murder against the disciples of the Lord. When a man is breathing murder against people, what does that mean to you? He's, he's breathing out threats and murder against Christians. I mean, does he, he's eating and breathing and sleeping killing people. <laughs> this is a terrorist in the, in the ultimate sense. That's what a terrorist does. He lives to kill. That's what a terrorist does. He lives to wreak, wreak havoc against things. And, and so we see that in the Middle East right now. You see this terrorism going on. That's what they're doing. They live to kill. They live to, 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 to turn things around upside down. And that's what Paul was doing he even went to the high priest and he asked letters from him who would, of the synagogues of Damascus. And I, he said, I want to go up to Damascus. I hear there's Christians 120 miles north of Jerusalem. Back there, that was the extent of basically Israel. From Jeru that's about 120 miles north to south. And he says, I got to go up there and get those people. It's like he's already kind of uh, in, imprisoned most of the other ones in the surrounding regions. And now he says, I hear there's some even further up there. And they, they're, they're causing 
the Christianity to grow up there. I got to go stamp this thing out. So they gave him, yeah, 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 we'll give you warrants for the arrest. So he's got them in hand. He's got a, probably a cohort behind him to go get them. He's running up there to go get them as fast as he probably can. And so here he comes. He's coming up there to get them. And of course, think about that. Here's a man who's on a mission. And that mission is, what, what's his, what does he go to bed thinking and what does he get up thinking? Killing Christians. Only when I have exterminated these people. Now, you're going to have one of the apostles. He's going to be called Simon the Z Zealot. What is a zealot? A zealot is, is a sakari. It's what a sakari is. A sakari means small dagger. And these guys carried small daggers. And what they look for, they look for Roman soldiers. And they would get them in a crowd. And they would run those little, those, 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 those sakari, they would run them into the backs of the, of the soldiers because you couldn't get them in the front because they were, they were equipped. But they, their vulnerability was to the back because the Romans built their, their army to never retreat, never turn their back or you'll be killed. And so there were, they weren't protected on the back. And so they learned how to learn how to walk into a crowd and kill a, a Roman soldier from behind. And, and, and see, so you think of Paul being a zealot in that, in that sense. He's doing that with Christians, though, instead of Roman soldiers. And you notice in Stephen's stoning, when, when it talked about in, in Acts 7, verse 58, they cast Stephen out of the city. They stoned him. The witnesses laid their clothes down at the feet of a young man. Here's a young man named Saul. And now the very first verse of chapter 8 says, and Saul was doing what? He was consenting to his death. I'm, I'm, I'm raising my voice. He's going to say later, I'm, I raised my hand consenting to to their death. Uh, I'm doing everything I can to kill these Christians. In Acts chapter 8, verses 3 and 4, as for Saul, and here's my word again, I don't know how your translation reads. My, the New King James talks about, the, uses the word havoc. He wreaked havoc. He made havoc of the church. And how did he do that? What does the Bible say? Entering into what? Every house and look what he did. Somebody read that next, that next section for me. Entering every house and doing what? Dragging off men and women. Off men and, can you get the picture? He's got, a, he's got Donna over here. He got her by the hair, just dragging her out, you know? Dragging her to prison. And that's just an amazing thing. Committing them to prison, throwing them in, into, bar, into, into iron bars and, and saying... You're going to stay there until your trial, and then when the, when the vote is cast, what am I going to do? I, I'm, I'm going to be one of the, the witnesses that arrested these people. They're going to call me to trial, and I'm going to raise my hand and say, kill her. Kill them. Kill them. Get that picture in your head, because when we see the conversion of Saul, that's you. That's me. And, and, and there's not a lick difference between any of us. We might not have done what he did, but in the sight of God, we did. Flip over to Acts 22. Acts 22. I want to read two or three verses here with you in Acts 22, verses 4 and 5. It's important that we spend some time talking about this. We can go quickly into his, his, his baptism, but I want you to see the background of when God forgives, that here's what He forgives. In Acts 22, verse 4, it says, I persecuted this way to the death, binding and delivering into prisons who? Men and women. And also the high priest bears me witness. Now, this is Paul retelling his story. That's what I mean. He, didn't, he never forgets the past, does he? And all the council of the elders, the Sanhedrin, from whom I also received letters to the brethren, and I went to Damascus, he's retelling the story, to bring in chains even those who were there to Jerusalem to be punished. Skip down to verse 19. So I said, Lord, they know that in every synagogue I imprisoned, and now just notice the next word. In verse 19 of, of Acts 22, I, I, am, I, I imprisoned and what? Beat those who believe in you. I get this picture that Paul didn't just have those people beaten. I think Paul himself beat them. He was that vicious. That tells you everything you need to know about this man as far as what he had done in the past. Flip over to Acts 26, just a couple of chapters over. In Acts chapter 26, verses 9 through 11. Acts 26, 9 through 11. Indeed, I myself thought I must do many things contrary to the name of Jesus of Nazareth. Now, he's telling a story once again. 
This I also did in Jerusalem, and many of the saints I shut up in prison, having received authority from the chief priest. And when they were put to death, here I wanted you to see it yourself. What did he do? When they were put to death, I cast... Get that picture in your mind. All in favor say aye. Paul's got his hand. In fact, he's going, ooh, me, me. Put them to death. Remember when they were yelling at Jesus' trial? What, were the, what was the crowd yelling? Let him be crucified. Let him be crucified. And that had to be a, a groundswell for Pilate, who had five times said, I find no fault in this man. He's doing everything he could to get Jesus released. And yet something persuaded this man. If there had only been two or three voices out there saying, yeah, killing, yeah, yeah, crucifying, Pilate wouldn't have given in to that because that wouldn't have been a threat to Rome. But what was going to be a threat to Rome? If there had been a complete upheaval in Jerusalem and, and a riot broke out, that would get attention in Rome. He couldn't allow that to happen. So now you had the groundswell of, I cru crucify him, crucify him. I see Paul doing the exact same thing. He has... He has, he's got these people all in a stir to say, let them be killed. I punish them often in every synagogue. Imagine going from village to village and town to town, going synagogue to synagogue and finding these Christians. And he compelled them to blaspheme and being, ex and here's, here's my word, exceedingly enraged. I looked that word up this morning. I was trying to hear the Greek word. You don't want to hear that Greek word but exceedingly enraged against them. That, that, if that, that doesn't, you can't see fire coming out of his eyes and, his, and his smoke coming out of his ears. He, he, is in, he, he said, I persecuted them even to foreign cities. There's a lot of other verses I want to look at here, but one of the ones I, I've got is in, in 1 Corinthians 15, verse 9. He says, I persecuted the church of God. And then in, in, in Galatians 1 and in verse 13, I persecuted the church of God beyond measure. And then finally in Philippians 3 and verse 6, concerning zeal persecuting the church. In other words, again and again and again, in every letter that Paul wrote, what does he tell about his past? I, I'm a persecutor. I compelled people to blaspheme. Think about that. Grabbing somebody and basically they say, you'll never get me to talk. I'll never say anything against Jesus Christ. And what did Paul do? He compelled them to blaspheme. He wouldn't probably take them and says, okay, you, you, you're willing to die? How about your wife and your three little kids? What if, I, what if I slaughtered them in front of your eyes? Paul was that, he was that desperate to get these people to blaspheme. Christ was anathema to him. That's not the Messiah of the Old Testament, Paul says. And so he's doing everything he can. But I want you to notice something in 1, Corinthians, or 1 Timothy 1 and verse 13. 1 Timothy chapter 1 and in verse 13. This is an interesting passage to me. He's talking to Timothy um, as he writes this first Timothy letter. And he says, Timothy, I was formerly a blasphemer. I was formerly a persecutor. And I was an insolent man. I don't know how your translation uses that word. But when he says I was a blasphemer, that means you speak disrespectfully, irreligiously, sacrilegiously against sacred things. But an insolent man, the, the, looked up the word, it means showing a rude and arrogant lack of respect. You think of an insolence. Yeah, he's full of insolence. He, a lack of respect for this person. When he, when he thought about Christians, he says, I have no respect for Christianity. I have no respect for Jesus Christ. He's a false prophet and he needs to be exterminated. That's how Paul thought about it. But notice then what it says. But I obtained mercy because... What? I did it ignorantly in unbelief. God saw in me something. I don't know what in the world God saw in me, Paul's saying, but God saw in me something. He saw sincerity. He saw, he saw that I was doing the best that I could in what I believed in. I was, I mean, this guy had to be sincere to do what he did, to have the energy and the drive to go from synagogue to synagogue, from village to town to all the way up to Damascus, doing everything and anything he could to, 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 to eliminate Christianity. God saw in this man, here's a man who has, in fact, remember in Acts 23 and again in Acts 24, Paul said, I have lived in all good conscience. 
to my God until this day. Now, when he's writing that in Acts 23, he's already done his three missionary journeys. He's back in Jerusalem. He's been arrested. He's now standing trial. He's giving a defense before a bunch of people. And he's saying, I've lived in all good conscience before God to this day. From my youth up, I have everything I've ever done, I did before for, for the glory of God. I did everything for God. I've always strove to, to have a conscience without offense toward God. Now Galatians 1 verse 15. You've got to turn to see this one. Galatians 1 verse 15. This is a fascinating passage to me. Galatians 1 and verse 15. But when it pleased God, interesting, who separated me from my, what? My mother's womb. Have y'all thought about that? And called me through His grace to reveal His Son in me that I might preach Him among the Gentiles. Now stop and think about that. Paul, first of all, he hated Christians, but what, else, what did he probably hate more than Christians? <laughs> Gentiles. And he, and he, and I can imagine when, when Ananias knocked on the door and said, hey, God called you to preach, to be an apostle to the Gentiles. And he's going, uh-uh, no way am I, no, no. I mean, it'd be like Jonah being sent to Nineveh. I'm going to Tarshish, man. <laughs> but here's what he said. He separated from me from my mother's womb to be an apostle to the Gentiles. From my mother's womb. Who does that sound like in the Old Testament? What prophet was called from his mother's womb to be a prophet of God? It was Jeremiah. Jeremiah chapter 1, verse 5. He said, from my mother's womb. He formed me in my mother's womb and called me to be a prophet. Jeremiah, and Jeremiah said, I, I'm, not, I'm not worthy to be your prophet God. And God says, I'm going to put my words in your mouth. Just like he said to Moses and others. When I call you to be a prophet, I'm not expecting you to be, er I mean, to be eloquent. I'm, I'm going to take care of the details. Paul, you do the same thing. I, I'm, call, I'm separating you. Because what did he see in Paul that would do that? What did he see that he says, I can use a man like this, who's got that kind of sincerity, that kind of conviction and drive? Man, if we could just get him converted... Now, he's not going to come down and miraculously. He's not going to make Paul do it. He wasn't from his mother's womb preordained and foreordained to become an apostle in the sense that, that, that God said, you're, you're unconditionally elected. He's going to give Paul a choice. When Ananias comes and knocks on the door and he says, arise and be baptized and wash away your sins, does he have a choice there? Paul has a choice. He, has a, he, he can choose not to. But what caused him not to? In Acts chapter 9, we go back to Acts chapter 9, and we see the story that we know he's got these arrest warrants in his hand. He's going up to Damascus. And as he comes to Damascus, he's nearing the city, and the Bible says, and suddenly what? A light. This is verse 3, Acts 9 verse 3. Suddenly a light shone around him from heaven. And he fell to the ground and he heard a voice saying, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? And he says, who are you, sir? He doesn't use the word L, capital O, capital R, capital D. That would be the word Yahweh. That would be the word for Messiah. That would be the word for God. But he says, who are you, sir? Who are you, Lord? And the Lord said, now he knows, I am Jesus whom you're persecuting. It's hard for you to kick against the, the, the pricks or the goads. You're, you're only hurting yourself, Paul, by what you're doing. Everybody you're killing and putting into prison, you know you're only sending them to heaven. <laughs> you're not you're eliminating Christians. You haven't eliminated one Christian who's been a faithful Christian. You haven't eliminated one faithful Christian. Even if they died, they're, with, they're, they're, they're saved. You haven't exterminated it. In fact, you propagated it. The more you're persecuting people, the more Christianity is spreading. It's only, you're only hurting yourself. And so then he turns and he, and he, he makes that ex, ex state. Remember when, when Paul was in, in 2 Corinthians 12, he talked about being caught up to the third heaven and he heard that he saw and heard things that were inexpressible and full of glory. 
What he saw in heaven, in the third heaven in the Jewish world, was heaven where the, the abode of God. He was up in the presence of God. I believe there was one of the... To be an apostle, the Bible says, you have to be an eyewitness of Jesus Christ. I think he saw him on the road, but that would have been a limited sense. But I think he, when he got up to third heaven, it was during his three years of uh, trial when he was in, the, in the, the, the desert. And I think Galatians will kind of bear that out. We'll talk about that maybe another time. It's part of my, my study of it. And I believe he was caught up to the third heaven. And I think in order to become an apostle, he had to be, when he says inexpressible words, that, meant, that doesn't mean he, he didn't have the words for it. It meant he, was, uh, he wasn't allowed to say it. I'm not allowed to tell you, like when Jesus on the Mount of Transfiguration, the, Peter, James, and John coming down, he says, you can't tell this to anybody. They saw it, they heard it, they, they, they knew the story, but they weren't allowed to say anything until after the resurrection. Paul is selling this, I was able to see and hear things that were inexpressible, that God didn't allow me to express them. But I'm telling you, I saw Jesus Christ. I spoke with Jesus Christ. I, I'm an, an apostle, not by the will of man, but by the will of God. And so I think Paul is, is able to tell us now, look, Ananias comes and knocks on the door. And he says in Acts 9, verse 6, so he trembling and astonished says, Lord, what do you want me to do? And on the road here, he says, Lord, what do you want me to do? There's the question that everybody has to ask about Paul and about anybody else for that matter. You have to ask the question. If you want to be saved, you have to ask the question. And what's the question? What must I do? If you don't ask that question, you'll not get an answer. Seek and you will find. Knock and it'll be open unto you. So what must I do? And, he, and of course, it means must do to, for what? I mean, what do you want me to do? And he says, the men who journeyed with him stood speechless, hearing a voice. They didn't see anyone. Saul arose from the ground, and when his eyes were open, he saw no one. But when they led him by the hand and brought him in Damascus, and he was three days without sight and neither ate nor drank. In other words, what was he doing for those three days? What do you think he was doing for those three days? What would you be doing for those three days? <laughs> Appetite wouldn't be there, would it? You're scared right down to your sandal straps. You're terrified. I have just seen the Lord. I have been... He's, God probably gave him three days to think about all those people that he drug into prison, all those people with blood on his hands that he killed and, and raised his voice against, all those things he had to remember, all of his past, all those things. And remember the Bible says he had he'd always lived in all good what before God? Good conscience before God. And he says... Look, if an honest man, if an honest man is presented with truth, he will either, if, he'll either cease to be honest, or he'll cease to be, and, and if he's mistaken, if, if an honest man is, is, is honestly mistaken and he's presented with the truth, what's going to happen? He's either going to cease to be honest or cease to be mistaken. And in Paul's case, what was he? He ceased to be mistaken. He was mistaken, and he says, I'm an honest man. I've, I've lived in all good conscience before God. And so you've got to ask the question, what must I do? And on the day of Pentecost, what did they ask? What must I do? And what did Peter say? Repent and be baptized. Remember the, 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 the Philippian jailer? Remember he was asked the question after the earthquake, and he runs in with the light, and the spring falls down. He says, men and brethren, what, what must I do to be saved? And he was told, believe in the Lord Jesus Christ. And the same hour of the night, what did he do? Same hour of the night. He was taught to be, he, you must be baptized. I mean, that's why he did it. He was baptized the same hour of the night. We, when we talk about Saul of Tarsus, we talk about Paul. Let me ask you a question. Have you ever run across anybody and they said, oh, I want to be saved like Paul. And what do they mean by that? When did they say Paul was saved? on the road. That's a strange salvation to me. You're on the road and you're saved after you say, who are you, Lord? And you're blind and you're miserable for the next three days. That doesn't sound like a saved man to me. Not at all. He's not saved at this moment. The Bible doesn't say he's saved. He didn't say some sinner's prayer. He was praying probably, but it, it wasn't a sinner's prayer. He was probably praying, what have I done? And so he's waiting, he's told to go wait, and there would be a man sent to him. In fact, God gave Saul a vision that there'd be a man come and knock on his door. And of course, Ananias was reluctant to do this because he said, hey, Lord, uh, um, uh, have you heard who this guy is? 
And you know what he's doing up here? Yeah, I know who he is, and I want you to go deal with him. Knock on the door and tell him what to do. So he goes and he, no he knocks on the door, and he says, look, the Holy Spirit sent me to give sight to you in and, and Acts 9 and verse uh, 17, and to be filled with the Holy Spirit. You've got a mission, Paul. Immediately there fell from his eyes something like scales, and he received his sight at once, miraculously. So there's the, Paul's first miracle. At least, at least he's the recipient of it. And he arose and was baptized. Now we're going to find out other cases like, Paul's going to retell this story again in Acts 22. He's going to retell the story again in Acts 26. And he, in Acts 22, what does he say in verse 16? When he, he retells the story and he, and he says, Ananias says, Arise and be baptized and what? Wash away your sins. So when do, we, when do we know that Paul was actually saved? Are you saved with your sins or without your sins? You're saved without your sins. Well, when did Paul get his sins washed away? When he was baptized. And so you want to be saved like Paul, that's what you've got to do. You've got to, you've got to ask the question, and what's the question? What must I do? When you're told by an inspired apostle like, or a prophet like Ananias or like Paul or anybody else, arise and be baptized and wash away your sins, Paul's saying, do what I did and you'll get what I got. I got God's grace. I got God's mercy. I got God's salvation. Who's the, who's the, who's the apostle that preached more on the grace of God than anybody else? We know it was Paul. By a long shot. Just look up the word grace, and, and those 13 books that Paul wrote, they're, they're, it's in every single one of his letters. Grace is found. Charis is the Greek word. It's found in every one of his letters. The grace of God. There but for the grace of God go I, is what Paul would say. By God's amazing grace. We're saved by grace through faith, that not of yourselves. It is the gift of God. And so when we're talking about then this saved like Paul, we go back to that question or that statement. A man who is honestly mistaken and confronted with the truth will either cease to be honest or cease to be mistaken. Now, which one was Paul? Cease to be mistaken. I've lived in all good conscience before my God to this day. Okay? Then what you do what Paul did, you'll get what Paul got. Paul arose and was baptized and washed his sins away. When we think about Paul now after his conversion, look at his life story. That's what I've spent the last uh, two or three years studying and reading the books on the, on the Apostle Paul's life. Here's a man who the Bible says, I compelled them to blaspheme. And then if you kept reading Acts 9, if you were looking at it just a moment ago, look at verse 20. Immediately he preached in the synagogue there in Damascus, he preached what? He preached Christ, that he is the Son of God. Verse 22, when he went to Damascus, proving that this Jesus is the Christ. Now, how do you, how do you prove Jesus is the Christ? Paul could prove that. He persuaded people by evidence. Faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. Paul could prove that Jesus is the Christ. And don't let anybody tell you that there's not enough evidence. There's evidence galore that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God. I don't need to, to see what Paul saw or to hear the inexpressible words that Paul heard to have the evidence that's overwhelming evidence to prove that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God. Paul, after his life, went everywhere preaching the Word. He went from the hunted or the hunter to the hunted, didn't he? He was the hunter. He was tracking everybody down, looking to kill them, and he became the hunted. So much so that even in Damascus when he was preaching, what did the, the brethren who were converted probably by Paul there in Damascus, during the middle of the night, what did they do to get Paul out of town? They put him in a, a large basket and let him down the wall and got away. And so here's a man who all of a sudden, he was here in Damascus to arrest these people, and it was those very people that were rescuing him. And, and, and letting him get away. Now, the rest of Paul's life, we won't take time to talk about that right now. What do we know? Remember that long catalog of verses in 2 Corinthians 11, all those things that he went through for, his, for the Lord Jesus Christ? Remember all that, that long list of things that he went through? 
He gave us this long catalog of, of persecutions and trials and tribulations that he went through. After Paul's conversion, here was a man who lived in good conscience. He said, I bury, I bury in my body the marks of the Lord Jesus, and I, and I love Jesus Christ. I want to close my lesson this morning with Galatians 2.20 again. I quoted it a while ago. I have been crucified with Christ. <coughs> this is Paul's kind of his magnum opus. This is his motto. This is his mission that he had in his life. In Galatians 2 and verse 20, I think is the best way that Paul could have described before and after. Paul's before and after picture. I have been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but Christ lives in me. In the life that I now live, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and he gave himself for me. Isn't that just a beautiful way to describe a summary of the life of the Apostle Paul? Imitate me as I imitated Christ. I hope that you can come to that grip in your own life. If we're ever going to convert people to Jesus Christ, they've got to see in us, you know, they've got to see in us that I love Jesus more than I love life itself. They've got to see in me that I'm willing to, to, to die for Jesus Christ. I'm willing to give my life for him because he gave his life for me. And if we, can, if we can believe that with all of our hearts, it's our life story that's going to let our light shine and bring glory to God and salvation to other men. And I want to imitate Paul in that regard. Thank you for your time this morning.